Hello everyone, this is Nat Rodriguez with Bear County 2 Fire Department and welcome to the Driver Operator Pumper Course. The book that we're going to be using is the IPSTA Pumping and Aerial Apparatus Handbook, the third edition. So before we get started, I want to go ahead and ask you, why are you taking this course? What are you trying to get out of it? Are you going to try to learn something or you just need a cert so you can promote? Or what is the main reason why you're, why you're trying to get this course? I just want to let you know that being a driver operator is probably one of the most important positions on the fire ground. Uh, people are going to be relying on you to know what you're doing. And also, people are going to be relying on you to get them from point A to point B safely. So with this course, you're going to have to read the book. You're going to have to start taking notes, read the book multiple times, especially uh, take notes. You're going to have to memorize some of your formulas and your coefficients in order to pass the TCAP exam. In the past, the TCAP exam has almost half of the questions are going to be your calculations and your formulas. So you're going to have to memorize your coefficients and your formulas. Okay, so I'm going to go over the chapters that we're going to be covering for the driver operator pumper course. Uh, chapter one is the types of apparatus. We're going to go over inspection, safety, positioning, the principles of water, the hose nozzles and flow rates, theoretical pressures, fire ground hydraulics, fire pump theory, operating fire pumps, static water supply, relay pumping, water shuttle, foam equipment, and apparatus testing. Also, we have specific days for y'all to come in and do your TCFP driver operator pumper skills that we're going to be covering. Hopefully we can cover all of them. Uh, there's 14 skills that we're going to be covering. Uh, the first two are your actual routine tests. Your first one is the preventative maintenance, and then the next one is your operational readiness. And then you go into the actual driving. Your non-emergency driving on a public roadway, uh, back into a roadway restricted space, maneuvering around roadway obstructions, which is your serpentine, your 180 degree confined space vehicle turn, uh, restricted horizontal vertical clearance, which is your diminishing clones, uh, driving defensively. Then we'll go into the operating apparatus, fixed systems and equipment, producing effective fire streams is when we go into your actual pumping, relay pumping, producing foam fire stream, and hopefully if we get a chance, we'll cover the fire sprinkler system for the actual skill and the standpipe system. All right. So chapter one, we describe the types of apparatus equipped with the pump which is all of chapter one. So learning objective number one, describe fire department pumpers. So what is the main function of a pumper? It's actually to get water to the fire scene. But where can you get water from? You can either get it from the apparatus internal tank, a fire hydrant, or a static water supply like a lake or a portable water tank. Now the minimum capacities that a pumper needs to have, uh, according to NFPA 1901, this could be a test question, the minimum tank capacity in order for it to be considered an engine is at least 300 gallons. And the minimum pump capacity has to be able to put out at least 750 GPMs, gallons per minute. The apparatus uh, must be equipped with certain items in addition to the fire pump, has to have intake and discharge pump connections, uh, pump controls and gauges, a variety of hoses and nozzles as well. Not only does it have to have all that equipment on there, it has to have uh, these these portable equipment. So your ground ladders, your SCBAs, forcible entry tools, salvage tools and equipment, portable water tanks, and emergency medical equipment. So depending on which fire department you work for, the, the medical equipment, you could be equipped with a cardiac monitor, or you could be more basic and have just a, a, a manual cuff and basic bandaging equipment. So it has to have at least these types of equipment. Uh, rescue pumpers combine the functions of a rescue company uh, with a department pumper. With Bear County 2 Fire Department, uh, we are capable to do all these types of incidents, medical, uh, medical incidents, rescue incidents, and extrication. 
incidents. Uh, we have the hydraulic tools equipped on our engines and they are considered rescue pumpers if you think about it. So how many of you have a pumper that's capable of carrying out these three tasks? Many pumpers can discharge uh, foam, class A or either class B fire. So foam plus plain water, our apparatus, our calves capable, mostly new pumpers discharge class A foam. Uh, some discharge calves just like us. So how many of you have calves on your, on your engines? A lot of the ARP trucks, they are capable to, to spray class B foam for all the, the jet fuel. So how many pumpers can discharge this type of uh, extinguishing agent of foam? Learning objective number two, describe initial attack fire apparatus. The book covers some of it. The initial fire attack apparatus are scaled down versions of full size pump pumpers. So our department, we had uh, smaller apparatus. They were considered mini pumpers. Other departments in rural areas, they'll have mini pumpers so they can get from point A to point B in those rural areas, often used to respond to incidents in areas with limited access. So right here on the left is our old squad that we used to use for our BLS calls. We would have uh, two guys hop in the squad. We, they were considered squads. And the reason why we had them equipped with the fire pump, the mini pumpers, is because if they were going to be out for any reason, they were going to be first on scene for any sort of fires, they are capable to, to spray water and hopefully reset the fire if they could. Uh, the vehicle on the right, the apparatus is called a mini pumper. It's it's in between the mini pumper and a full size engine. So usually we can get to places where the engine can't go. So that's the main reason for the, for these apparatus. Learning objective number three: describe mobile water supply apparatus. So what does that entail? That's actually our water tender. Mobile water supply apparatus transport water to areas where a water system is not existent or inadequate. In our jurisdiction, we have plenty of areas where they do not have any hydrants or the hydrants are not very good. So these types of apparatus are called water tenders or tankers. According to NFPA, what's the minimum amount of water to be considered a mobile water supply? So this might be a test question. It has to have at least a thousand gallons of water in order for it to be considered a water tender. So the capacity of a mobile water supply apparatus is based on a variety of factors. So what can it do, where can it go, and who can operate it? So if you're going to order, if your department is going to order a water tender or plan on having one of them in your jurisdiction, it has to think about the terrain in your jurisdiction. If there's any bridges and weight limits in your area, you have to know about that too. And the interoper interoperability of it, you know, how is it going to function on the fire ground? The mobile water supply apparatus have two basic functions on the fire ground. They can be used as a shuttle operation to where the tender is going to the hydrant and going back to the fire scene and dumping water. Or it can be used as a stationary reservoir. It can be used as its own hydrant, pumping into the initial fire, fire truck. So know the difference between both tasks. Learning objective number four, distinguish among, among specialty fire apparatus. So this is when we go to all our brush trucks. Okay, combating wildland fires requires all terrain apparatus that are lightweight and highly maneuverable. So these are our brush trucks that we have here with Bear County Two Fire Department. The one here on the left, we obtained that one a few years ago from San Antonio. The one here in the middle is uh, probably one of our better brush trucks that it can go uh, all terrain, all four wheel drive that we use plenty of times on a lot of wildland fires in our area. And then this apparatus here on the right is our six by. It holds a lot of water. It can, it can go through all different types of terrain. A lot of people swear by it. And the main reason, you know, because it does not get stuck, but we have to keep in mind that it is top heavy uh, you know, 
ask yourself, when was the last time you drove one of these apparatus? It's probably a good idea to go ahead and practice on them, driving them around and get more comfortable. The good thing about the, the brush trucks, it has a pump and roll system. It's an advantage when combating wildland fires. So the good thing about it is that you can drive at the same time that you're spraying water. Also keep in mind that it has a separate motor or a PTO to power the power pump. Sometimes it will have its own separate uh, fuel tank and you have to make sure that it is uh, topped off every morning. During your morning checks to make sure the pump motor is separate from the fuel tank, check to make sure that it has fuel. Unfortunately with these uh, wildland apparatus there's no more riding on the outside anymore because it can result in, uh, in severe injury. So it was fun while it lasted, but it's dangerous and we can't do it anymore. Most wildland fire apparatus will be equipped with additional equipment, uh, hoses, forestry hose, small diameter attack hoses, nozzles, ground sweep nozzles, or remote controlled. With these uh, wildland trucks, they'll have the, the ground sweep nozzles on the front end of it. Also, I like the, uh, the remote controlled ones where you have the joystick inside the cab to where you can spray water, you know, using the joystick. And uh, some, some wildland trucks, they, are, uh, they do have calves or they calves capable and they will also spray foam as well. Uh, some aerial apparatus are equipped with fire pumps as well. Uh, this is our uh, platform 124. It's a quint. It carries 300 gallons of water. Uh, it also has forestry hoses on it as well. So for any for that type of situation, this uh, platform 124 has been in first in on a few fires already, and it's only been in service for about two years. So it can be first in on fires, and it has 300 gallons of water. So some some benefits of having the aerial apparatus with the fire pump you know you can use it as an engine or a ladder if you can it should be positioned with consideration of reach of the aerial device so if you're going to be purchasing or you do have an aerial apparatus that is can be functioned as an engine it has to be positioned uh, with consideration of the limitation of the aerial device you know how long is it how far can it reach if you need to use the aerial apparatus for any reason. Uh, some rescue vehicles may be equipped with small fire pumps and tanks, uh, extinguish small fires, provide protective hose lines and extrication, and other incidents may feature specifically foam equipment. Uh, they probably might not have the fire capabilities of a full-size pumper. Uh, maybe sometime in your career you might see some ambulances that are equipped with uh, with small pumps. Uh, I've never seen one. I don't know if, if there will ever be any in our area. Uh, but just keep in mind that that do some ambulances do have small pumps on them. Learning objective number five, we're going to identify apparatus mounted special systems. Uh, this is all your uh, generators and lights and things like that. So the apparatus are often equipped with electric power generation equipment. You'll have your fixed system and your portable system. What kind of fuel does your company carry for this mobile generator? We use the four cycle. Uh, just make sure that you're checking it periodically in the mornings as well. Uh, making sure the, the plugs are not corroded or anything like that. And make sure you know they're working properly every morning. So you'll have your portable and your fixed systems. Extension cords and other electrical equipment are commonly stored on the pumping apparatus. So you'll have a whole bunch of extension cords, adapters, uh, to all that have to be plugged into your junction boxes. You know, how we would usually do it when you have a new guide or probe, just ask them to set the lights up with the junction box. It's a good refresher, especially for yourself. Uh, watch them fumble around with the cords and different connections it, it's, it's a good refresher okay you might use these as well uh, to connect the sawzalls especially for any type of extrication off the roadway where it's kind of far from the apparatus you'll have to use the uh, the portable generators 
Uh, some pumping apparatus may be equipped with uh, rescue tools. Uh, these are the common rescue tools that it has, extrication equipment, or our down south departments uh, on the south side of San Antonio, they have combination spreaders and shear tools. Uh, also be equipped with extension rams. Mm. So all of our engines here at Bear County 2 Fire Department are equipped with extrication tools. Um, they have, uh, they are the hydraulic tools and they're, they're pretty capable of, of doing the same thing as the hydraulic tools that we used to have. So these are our extrication tools right there. And that is it for chapter one. I'll see you here in chapter two.